Dalton. Welcome to Active Aging, a program devoted to exploring issues of importance to older people and people living with disabilities. Each month, we provide information and resources to help you live a healthy, healthy satisfying, and independent life. This month, my guest is Al Solomon, manager of the Money Management Program at Somerville Cambridge Elder Services. Al, welcome to the program. Thank you, Marianne. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and um, you know, I know a lot of people have been helped by the Money Management Program, but I think the general community really doesn't know that much about the program, so I'm really pleased to have you here to tell us a little bit of, about it. Can you just give us a brief overview of what money management does? Sure. The, the big picture is that the goal of the Money Management Program is the same as the goal of Somerville Cambridge Elder Services, and that's to keep people living independently in their own homes. Uh, by money management, we're not talking about financial planning or estate planning. We're talking about helping people with simple everyday tasks such as bill paying, balancing a checkbook, reconciling a bank statement, uh, running a bank errand, those types of, of tasks. And, um, and how do people come to you how, and, and where do you get your referrals from? Most of the referrals come from the case managers within the agency, um, but oftentimes people will be aware of the program and call the agency and make a self-referral. Uh, they realize they need the, the assistance, or I'll get a call from a, another social service agency in the area. Sometimes I'll get a call from uh, an officer at a bank who's noticed that uh, a customer who's been coming in for a while uh, has become increasingly confused, the transactions become more difficult. Interesting. Yeah, so um, it's kind of interesting. So what, what kind of, what are other situations you might find where, you know, people, what kind of situations are people's finances in when you, when they come to you for help? Well, that, that varies. Yeah. Um, but typically, um, a person who is referred, for example, by someone in the agency, is someone who needs assistance reading and writing, um, there might be memory loss or confusion. The person might have some physical disability uh, that's preventing them from taking care of their finances, such as being legally blind. Um, their hand might shake too much, so they can't write a check. Uh, the person might be illiterate. The person might not speak English well. Uh, there's just a whole host of uh, reasons why someone would, would utilize the program. And, um do the people have to meet some kind of eligibility criteria to, to get into the program, to get assistance? We do have um, income guidelines and asset guidelines. Uh, the program is designed, by the way, primarily by AARP, and it's sponsored by them as well as Mass Home Care and the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. And AARP has uh, adopted the same financial guidelines as, uh, as home care uses mm -hmm. at, uh, at Somerville Cambridge Elder Services. So for a single person, um, the income level is around $23,000, let's say, and for a couple, it's um, $37,000. I'm sorry, $31,000. Mm -hmm. um, but if someone is, uh, finds that they have either uh, greater income or greater assets, uh, then, then what I just mentioned, th there's there's a, a way we can accommodate that person as well. So almost anyone, as long as they're a resident of Somerville or Cambridge, is eligible for the for for assistance. Now I know um, people's finances are so personal, and it's it's a huge thing to give up um, or to perceive to give up control of your finances. Um, and I think people want to be um, certain that the people they're handing some control over to, they can trust them and um, they are gonna be doing a good job. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how the programs run in terms of monitoring and, um, you know, checking on, you know, the, the volunteers who work on the program? Well, that's a complicated question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, maybe before answering that, I'll mm -hmm. talk about the two levels of assistance okay. that the program offers. Um, we offer, bill payer assistance and also uh, representative payee assistance and uh, with bill payer assistance this gets to some of the points mm -hmm. that you you raised there with bill payer assistance um, the volunteer meets with the individual in his or her own home 
and helps that individual in whatever way they need to be helped. Um, the client or consumer um, maintains control over all financial decisions and signs the check and uh, they can, can terminate the relationship at any time. If for any reason they're not happy, I would hope they would call either their case manager. So they still have quite a lot of control. Absolutely, yeah. or, or me first mm -hmm. before they do that. And I want to say I've, I've, I've uh, been program manager now about eight and a half years, and um, uh, I can't think of, uh, virtually can't think of a single instance where, where someone's been unhappy with the service they've, they've received. So, um, that's one level of assistance, which is bill payer assistance. The second level is representative payee assistance. And that's where the individual um, has been deemed, usually by a physician, to be incompetent or incapable of managing their own finances. Maybe they're just too confused. And um, in that instance, the agency becomes the representative payee for that particular individual. We appoint a volunteer who helps that individual one-on-one, uh, -on -one, and, um, and it's the volunteer who signs the checks. So the individual in, that, in those circumstances does not have access to his or her own money, and usually that's for their own protection. Um, with regard to part 2B of the question <laughs> you asked, um, the volunteers themselves uh, are screened. Um, they need to send in an application uh, which contains uh, three references. We check all references. We do a Cori check, which is the criminal background check. And, um, and then the volunteer goes through a, uh, a two-hour training and um, then about a, an hour uh, individual meeting with me so I can get to know them uh, better, which enables me to match them more successfully with, with someone. And so who, we who ensures um, that the volunteers are doing a good job? I know you do a lot of excellent screening, but on an ongoing basis, how do you make sure that they're, they're doing their job? Uh, several ways. The, the primary way is that we, um, we, meaning the money management program, uh, monitors the work that all the volunteers do. So one of the requirements of the program is that the bank statements um, uh, come directly to Somerville Cambridge Elder Services. Uh, we photocopy them and mail them immediately to the to the client. Um, but we then monitor those accounts. So we look. So a third party is looking at um, literally every check that's being written uh, to make sure that it's a legitimate expense and. Uh, is um, being used in the best interest of the of the client. I also want to mention, in terms of requirements of the program, you know, you asked me who was eligible. Um, as I said, pretty much any resident of Somerville or Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, and but in terms of requirements of the program, uh, the bank statements uh, come directly to the agency, and then the client is uh, required to have a checking account or be willing to open one. Mm -hmm and the volunteer would help in that instance, and required to have direct deposit. Okay, now, so you guys are, sounds like you're doing a very thorough job of um, monitoring the activities of your, of your volunteers. Does anyone monitor your program to make sure that the program is being managed correctly? We're monitored, um, we're monitored by the state. Mm -hmm. Program. As a matter of fact, they recently were in the middle of a, of a state review right now, where they come down and look at the work that we're doing. And also because we're an organizational representative payee, uh, recently Social Security has come in to also uh, review the program and to make sure that uh, all the procedures are, um, you know, in place that need to be in place to protect the, the clients, the best interest of the clients. So uh, what, uh, what I think is kind of interesting about the program is that um, it sounds like for a lot of these people um, who you're serving, you know, without the assistance of money management, they might not be able to live independently. It, you know, they are functioning on a, on a pretty good level in other aspects of their life, but there's this one critical piece where they can't really function. So from that perspective, you're really, um, you know, an important piece in keeping people in their homes. Right. Yeah. Um, 
because many for many elders are homebound number one it makes it difficult for them to to get to the bank to do simple things um, and many elders also uh, without the assistance of money management would be receiving um, eviction notices or shut off notices or um, you know maybe they're bouncing checks uh, uh, you know in terms of eviction notices or shut off notices things that that not that many years ago might have resulted in someone being um, placed in a, in a nursing home or some other type of institution because they weren't able to manage simple simple finances so it's really a great use of um, you know volunteer resources and, and that's the next piece I really wanted to talk about because I know you're always looking for volunteers because um, you know there's always more people who need help and um, you know, could you talk a little bit about what the volunteers' job is like, the kind of time commitment they make, and um, other things they might, you know, want to know about if they're considering being a volunteer? Sure. Um, it sounds self-serving to say, but but volunteering uh, in the money management program is a very rewarding experience. As we found that to be true when we've surveyed the volunteers um, um, universally. Uh, really, what they're providing, I, I mean. On, uh, you know, on paper, it's money management assistance, but really what they're providing is peace of mind for the client because the client finally has someone uh, whom they can trust to help them with, uh, with tasks that they used to be able to do. And the client also might not have family or friends who could help them, but in many instances, uh, clients don't want family or friends yeah. involved in their financial, uh, financial matters. Um, what, what was the other part of that? Um, well, you know, what kind of time commitment oh, time might commitment, they make, yeah. and um, you know, what what would they should they expect if they were thinking about being a volunteer? The the time commitment is minimal. It's about four to six hours a month. Um, most volunteers see their clients one to two times mm -hmm. a month, generally at the beginning of the month to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they might see them uh, a second time during the month to give them some cash if, the, if they need it. Um, and they are uh, um, required, there's a there's certain amount of paperwork mm -hmm. that's re required. They, they turn in a monthly report telling us what's going on with the client in terms of the services they provided, any problems they encountered, um, and any general comments. So for a pretty limited time commitment, they can have a really big impact in an older person's life. Basically, you know, with four to six hours, they're keeping someone in the community who might be forced otherwise to go into an institution. That's right. And those four to six hours, by the way, I want to say are complete. This is another yeah. benefit, uh, not benefit, but it's it's a, a plus in terms of volunteering for this program. The four to six hours uh, are, are completely flexible. It's up to uh, the volunteer to just set a time with the client. So it could be, you know, any evening, any afternoon, any morning, anything that's mutually convenient. So it's very simple. Well, we'll definitely provide the number of the program so people, if they're interested in volunteering or interested in being a client, can, can call in at, um, okay. to our office. To and we are uh, always looking for volunteers. Yeah. We How always, many volunteers do you currently have? Well, there are about 70 people in the mm -hmm. program, um, of which uh, 55 are bill payers. I'm rounding off, and about 15 are representative payees. We always have more more bill payers. And there are about the same number, about 70 volunteers. We match volunteers one-on-one -on -one with clients. So there's a, um, a meaningful contact usually that's made, you know, a relationship that, that develops. But we're always looking for volunteers. We, uh, we currently have a waiting list of about 20 people uh, who are waiting. Okay, now um, switching gears for a moment, I know one of the the things that you encounter often in um, the money management program are, um, well, two issues. Financial exploitation of older people, maybe by someone in their lives that they know. And then the, the other issue that I'd like to talk about are, are um, scams, which older people are often the, the victims of. And um, so first, let's talk about financial exploitation. Um, what kind of situations do you see and, and how um, can people respond to them if they know of an older person in the community who's being exploited? Well, virtually without exception, um, all the instances of financial exploitation I've seen um, are committed by family members. Mm -hmm. It's usually a son or a daughter or a niece or a granddaughter. 
someone who has access to the elder, mm -hmm. who knows what buttons to push, um, and also can rely um, on the fact that chances are that elder won't uh, press charges mm -hmm. against them. So, um, you know, examples that I've seen, um, people going in and uh, stealing checks from a, um, from a blind person, yeah. and then uh, writing the checks and forging her name, and then cashing the checks. Uh, you, you know, that's, that's one example. Um, generally, it's, um, in, most instances, in most instances, it's been, a, again, a, a close relative who simply either manipulates or coerces or intimidates the, the elder to, to give them money. And, and you work very closely with the Protective Services Department yes, at Somerville Cambridge Elder mm -hmm. Services. And can you talk a little bit about your relationship with them and what they do? Well, Protective Service um, investigates cases where there are financial exploitation. And financial exploitation involves um, a perpetrator and a victim. Um, and uh, once someone suspects some type of financial exploitation or financial abuse, Protective Service will um, go out and, um, and, and investigate to see exactly what the, what the facts are. And so um, a number of the cases that you're, you work on have really been the result of Protective Services going in, investigating, and trying to come up with some you know, workable solution mm -hmm. to protect the elder. You have, am I correct, you have a lot of cases from them? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I didn't mention, I'm, I'm a volunteer in the program myself, and I, and I have been for 10 years now with the same individual. He was a victim of financial exploitation. And the only way we could protect him was to change his status from a bill payer client to a representative payee client. He didn't have access to his own money. So the people who were manipulating him and intimidating him to go get money for them could no longer do that. Oh, that's wonderful. So as a result of your involvement, you've been able to, he's been able to stay in the community and... Uh, and is very so. comfortable. He owns all these buildings. Right here <laughs> um, no, he's, he's, you know, he's financially, he's, he's in the black. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, I mean, to, just to give you a real life example, when I met him, he, he didn't have enough uh, money to last to the end of the month. He had no phone. He had debts. Um, that's all gone away. As well as this, you know, group of parasitic scum, as I call them, you know, who were constantly preying on him. Yeah, and that's and, and that's that's hard, especially when someone starts to either lose some of their you know cognitive abilities or they're frail, isolated, alone. They're really can be a prime target of the, this kind of be behavior. Right, and in his instance, he uh, he's illiterate, so he he had to rely on other people to help him. Yeah, and people who so they could easily no yeah. no. And so, um, and then the, the second piece that I wanted to talk to you about was this, the, the scams. You know, we're hearing more and more, I'm constantly getting actually emails about this, that there's a new scam in the community, watch out for, for this, and, and frequently they are preying upon older people. Um, could you talk about some of the, the common ones so our audience can be aware of it and, you know, when, and protect themselves? Yeah, I, I, I mean, there are many, uh, you know variations uh, on, on scams, but but the one uh, point that I would want to emphasize is uh, to never give any personal information on the phone to anyone. Do not give your social security number. Don't give your checking account number. Uh, don't give anything out that someone can utilize to access uh, your funds. So. Um, Th those might be telephone scams. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of a scam that's that's pretty subtle, actually. It's where someone calls, and um, now the person uh, the person calling uh, is always calling from, uh, you know, the fraud division of your credit yeah, yeah. card company, or the police department, or Social Security, or the jury Some commission. Official exactly, group. and they so they they. Um, you know, basically trick you into thinking um, that you're talking to a, a legitimate person. But but one of the scams I've always liked as a <laughs> as a clever scam is um, they will tell you that there's been fraudulent activity on your credit card, 
and they want to ensure that you have your credit card in your possession and so you get your credit card and then they ask you to confirm there's an ID number on the back of your credit card. It's not your credit card number. It's generally in the signature box. It's three or four digits. They ask you to read that number to them just to confirm that you actually are in possession yeah. of your credit card. Well, you're not giving them your credit card number, and so uh, you, you feel comfortable giving them what's, what appears to be this meaningless number that, that, that no one's ever told you about. But uh, I have noticed sometimes when I do make a credit card purchase on the phone that they're actually asking for that number now mm -hmm. um, to, to confirm that, that you're in possession of the card and not just the number. But, uh, so, so that's a typical telephone kind of scam where someone's trying to get information out of you. Um, another scam um, is any type of uh, letter um, informing you that, for example, you've won a lottery. Mm -hmm. It's a lottery you didn't know about, it's a lottery in a different country, it's a lottery you would never entered, but they send you a letter telling you you've won, and I brought uh, you know, such a letter yeah. in, and um, I'm trying to do this quickly here. Um, this is a letter informing, this was one of the, this was one of the, uh, the letter's not particularly meaningful, um, but it just says to the individual, it's to inform them they've won $275,000. Was this received by one, one of, our of our clients? One of our clients, actually. Uh, yeah, one of our clients. This was actually received by one of our clients. And so she was informed that she had won $275,000, and they were sending her um, a check, enclosed with this was a check for $3,980.89. I, I, they always, yeah. it's always some odd number. Yeah. It's never 4,000, but just for s purposes of uh, simplicity and for the sake of discussion, I'm gonna round it up. They sent her a check for $4,000 um, as part of the 275. They wanted her to cash the check and send them back $3,000. So, and I'm going to show you the check um, yeah, I thought of that. because uh, this is a, it's a counterfeit check, but it's a very real piece of paper. Yeah. Um, it has the watermark on it. When you hold it to the light, it shows the watermark. This, this is an authentic piece of paper, and it looks like any bank check or cashier's check you've ever seen. So, the individual would take this check to the bank, deposit it. Now, this, this is where it gets confusing because the bank will take the check and will tell you that the funds will be available tomorrow. That does not mean that the check has cleared. Oh, and that's see. very important that just because you go in on Monday with this bogus piece of paper and the bank says, come back tomorrow, we'll give you the funds, um, that doesn't mean that the piece of paper is, is a valid check. They are merely, they're required by law to make the funds available to you on the next business day. So that does not mean, and I can't emphasize this strongly enough, that the check has cleared. It does not mean that. So if you've gone ahead and written the other check, then you're out the $3,000. Correct. Okay, right. So, so you, would be, you would take $3,000, write a check, which is coming out of your account, um, and... Uh, um, and send it, which is real money. And then by the time you discover from the bank that the check is no good, the perpetrators at the other end have cashed your check. And your and check so, is good. Oh, your check <laughs> is good, yeah. And, and then you have to cover the, cover the money. Yeah. Well, so I mean, I think the message to our viewers is they should really be suspicious of, of, of this kind of communication and, you know, and. Any time you get any type of check um, that uh, needs, you, you, you know, where someone says you've won something, or if you are, I know we're running out of time here, but if, if you are selling something, for example, and someone contacts you and is willing to pay you more money than the item's worth, and again, it involves, you know, sending you a check, and oh, by the way, for your trouble, keep an extra 500, yeah. send me back the change, any, any transaction of that nature, sure. they should call. They, they can talk to anyone at their bank, I'm yeah. sure, yeah. Um, who so would help them. that just set up a red flag, though. Yeah, a huge red flag. Anytime there's a, 
as I say, a, a, a check involved. Well, thank you very much, Alice. It's been really informative. What? Thank you we're for, out of time? Uh, we're out of time. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's it for this month. <laughs> but, I'm, um, you know, you've you really provided us some, some good information. Thanks for watching Active Aging. Please join us next month.